said, my name is Louis Bardell, and uh, I don't think it said it just like that. <laughs> oh, I thought he said that my name is Louis Bardell, and that's who I am. And uh, I'm here to present to you a few books that uh, FrenchQuarterLit.com has published. set myself up here. So, uh, French Quarter Lit is an independent press, or an indie press, and it's uh, based largely online, and uh, wherever I happen to be living at the moment. Um, currently, I'm living here in uh, my hometown of Staten Island. Uh, FrenchQuarterLit.com is an offshoot of two projects. Uh, one is the online magazine stageandscreenwriters.com where I have tried to publish my friends who are poets, writers, photographers, and models. And the second project is a literary tour that I do in New Orleans where I take people around to uh, literary heritage sites within the French Quarter. And so combining those two projects, uh, we have come up with an independent publishing house FrenchQuarterLit.com and I think there's a lot of room for growth both in print and online. Uh, we have three books so far which are all available for sale tonight. Uh, the first one is uh, Adventures of the Roving Romantic uh, which is a uh, it's a screenplay <laughs> about a girl crazy troubadour roaming the streets of Los Angeles in a car. It is a visual homage to the beautiful city of angels and it has a very sexy cover. Uh, the second title is The Tropic of Poetry by Will Wynn. The cover is simple. I'll show you. The cover is simple fashioned after the Samuel French drama titles that people might see uh, in uh, theater circles, but it belies a powerful work of art. With, within are poems from a man who, at his best, is lyrical, evocative, vivid, and musical, and just as good, if not better, than many of today's mainstream poets. Yeah. Yes. Hey. Yeah. You listen to that, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. It contains superb translations of Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. Will Wynn is a fine poet, and his oeuvre, am I pronouncing that correctly? Oeuvre is, his body of work is worth exploring. Who speaks French around here? You know you speak French. How do you say oeuvre? Am I, I'm saying it correctly? Oeuvre. Uh, finally, okay, so, Tropic of Poetry. Finally, a work that I am quite proud of and that I have worked very hard to put together is the Allen Ginsberg interview. It is a project that began 20 years ago. It is the Allen Ginsberg interview. It began 20 years ago, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. The interview with poet Allen Ginsberg, who I found in his office in Brooklyn College back in 1995, was done when I was a student in the City University of New York. The interview not only fundamentally changed the way I thought about politics and art, but it has also given me a chance to engage the public in a way that I might not have had otherwise. The book and the memory of the poet spark conversations. It lends itself to theater presentations, and to forums like this one. Quite honestly, the damn book sells itself, is what I am saying. So, um, me, uh, we last appeared here at Everything Goes on February 28th with a dramatic reenactment of the Allen Ginsberg interview performed by myself, Lee Porio, and Louis Blois as Ginsberg. And I think they did a fine job. I would like to delve a little further into the book and discuss Allen Ginsberg's lover of over 40 years, 
His other half, poet and general renegade soul, Peter Olavsky. Olavsky is focused on at the back of the book. Uh, in a report I did on the auction of the Allen Ginsberg estate at Sotheby's back in the late 90s. Just before the auction began, I ran into Olofsky on York Avenue in Manhattan. Wow. This whole project of the Allen Ginsberg interview has been peppered by an uncanny air of serendipity. This chance encounter was, of course, after Ginsberg's death in 2007. Olofsky was born in 1933 and passed away in 2010 from complications due to lung cancer. He was 76 years old and not a bad age for a renegade. So, I'd like to present a few slides. Uh, actually, there's one right there. Uh, then read the article, and then I'll read one of uh, Olavsky's poems. So, uh, this picture that you see up here right now is Allen Ginsberg on the left and Peter Olavsky on the right. This is uh, 1956 uh, in New York City, I believe. And at this point, Ginsberg is 30 years old because he was born in 1926, and uh, Olavsky is 23. Okay? Uh, next slide, please. Now, Seven years later, 1963, and uh, they've had the Beat Generation uh, movement kick off, and uh, 1963, the Civil Rights Movement is uh, alive and kicking, and uh, these two men have changed a little bit, as you can see. Olavsky decided to grow a beard, and I think so did Ginsburg. Very hairy. Uh, Maybe they should play for the Boston Red Sox, right? <laughs> um, okay, and then, uh, let's see, uh, we have another photo from 1987, which would be uh, 24 years later, I think, right? Here we go, there they are. Ginsburg on the left and Olavsky on the right. Still together. Still together, they were lovers for over 40 years. They met in the early 50s through uh, a poet, Robert Levine. No, not a, po a poet and a painter, Robert Levine. Okay. Um, these guys, you know, you could say their poetic uh, ethic was to bear the soul, uh, to show what people really think instead of what, you know, they want you to, you know, what people want you to think or you want other people to believe you think. It's just basically telling the truth. And part of that was, you know, showing that the emperor have no clo uh, wears no clothes. So if you look at the next one, Olavsky doesn't wear any clothes either. <laughs> the Beats were known for doing their poetry naked, especially when they were spending time in London. They would... Uh, it's kind of chilly. In Paris, right? It's kind of cool over there. Right? And you did too? Uh, well, I kept my underwear on. <laughs> so, uh, and then finally, as I said, he passed away in 2010, and the next picture shows what he looked like at that time. Not a bad guy. I think he's of Russian descent. Uh, okay, so, I will read the article that's found in the back of the Allen Ginsberg book about meeting Peter Olowski. Uh, I was covering the auction as a reporter and I happened to meet uh, Olowski out on the street, as I said. Uh, this was in October of 1999. So I'm walking uptown along York Avenue this past Thursday with Peter Olofsky, author of Clean Asshole Poems and Smiling Vegetable Songs. And he's telling me about his life. I'm very busy these days, he says. Doing what, I ask? Meditation. I meditate all day and I don't have time for anything else. 
People tell me to start writing again, but I just don't have the time. Olavsky has managed, however, to part from his reflective moments to show up for the auctioning off of Allen Ginsberg's estate at Sotheby's, which is just a few blocks south down York. Olavsky, of course, was Ginsberg, Ginsberg's lover for over 40 years, and he's also one of the beneficiaries of the Allen Ginsberg Trust. So he's got a vested interest in this day's proceedings. I got to eat something he tells me as he surveys the menu of every eatery on the block. Otherwise, I'll get hypoglycemic. He finally settles for a combination dish of potato and egg salad and coleslaw out of some deli. I get an orange. I watch him pay the man at the counter. Olavsky is slow. He seems a little confused. He's also big and hefty, not the same beautiful man with whom Ginsburg fell in love. This is a man who is a recovering cocaine addict, who had lost contact with all his friends for eight years, even Ginsburg. Perhaps now the meditation he does is helping, to him, helping him to recover. As we walk out of the deli, I hold the door open for him, and as we walk towards Sotheby's, he finds a place to sit down on an air-conditioned cover sticking out of a window on the corner of 72nd. Have a seat, he says. The space is... To, uh, the space to sit is small, and we sit very close together. I ask him if he misses Ginsburg. Oh, sure, he says, and becomes quiet. Perhaps he is saddened by the thought of his dead lover, or perhaps he's just in a rush to eat. The auction was set to resume in 20 minutes. He starts throwing pieces of his food on the floor. So soon pigeons come flocking out of nowhere. They love eggs, eggs and fish. But they don't like oranges, he says. I throw a piece of my fruit on the floor to see, and he's right. The pigeons won't go near it. Sounds like you feed a lot of pigeons in your day. See, it sounds like you fed a lot of pigeons in your day, I say. Oh, yeah. I used to feed them all the time, he says. But I don't have time anymore because I'm always meditating. He keeps flicking food from his plastic deli dish onto the floor, and the pigeons are having a feast. Then he brings up Ginsburg again. Ginsburg was going to a heart specialist up in Boston before he died. Somebody who had won the Nobel Prize, but Ginsburg didn't have a bad heart. He had a rotten liver. He was getting the wrong advice. He finishes his meal as I ask him all about the beats. Jack Kerouac worked very hard at being a writer, he says, recalling the granddaddy of the beats who Olofsky claims had 150 IQ and can type 100, could type 155 words per minute. He developed a style that allowed him to write a lot of books, but he was a hard drinker and he let his mom tell him what to do. Alan and I couldn't even visit him in the end because she didn't like us. Olavsky lights up a cigarette and we lumber towards the auction house where he greets one of his many friends outside the crowded entranceway and we lose contact with each other. I walk into the building with Ed Sanders beat-era poet and founding member of the band The Fugs up to the fifth floor where they're having the sale. I wish I had, uh, they're, not, they're not auctioning off uh, Neil Cassidy's 1947 Studebaker that only had second gear, says Sanders. I'd like to buy some of those early Beatmobiles, early Fords and old Plymouths. I ask him if he thinks the auction presents a contradiction in anti-materialistic beat generation patterns. There's a conflict, and yet at the same time there isn't a conflict, he says. It's very zen. There's either a full universe or an empty universe. Should you live with a backpack, or can you live in the Taj Mahal? Judging by the results of the sale, it appears the Beats, or at least their beneficiaries, will be taking the materialist route. The auction, officially titled Allen Ginsberg and Friends, brought in over $670,000. Perhaps not good enough for the Taj, but certainly good enough for plenty of potato, egg, and coleslaw meals. <laughs> Peter Olavsky. So I will conclude with a, uh, a poem that uh, Olavsky wrote called First Poem. 
And it's the first poem in the Clean Asshole book. Clean Asshole and Vegetable Songs. Is that how it is? Clean Ass... That's... Smile. Smiling Vegetable. Smiling Vegetable, right. Okay, first poem. By the way, Olofsky was a terrible speller, and if you look, read the book, you'll see a lot of typos, and, and you might say to yourself, God, whoever published this book doesn't even check the work, but they purposely kept all his typos uh, in the work, and they considered it some kind of like sacred, first thought, best thought kind of a thing. Uh, first poem, which is spelled F-R-I-S-T. A rainbow comes pouring into my window. I am electrified. Songs burst from my breast. All my crying stops. Mystery fills the air. I look for my shoes under my bed. A fat colored woman becomes my mother. I have no false teeth yet. Suddenly, ten children sit on my lap. I grow a beard in one day. I drink a whole bottle of wine with my eyes shut. I draw on paper and I feel I am two again. I want everybody to talk to me. I empty the garbage on the table. I invite thousands of bottles into my room. June bugs, I call them. I use the typewriter as my pillow. A spoon becomes a fork before my eyes. Bums give all their money to me. All I need is a mirror for the rest of my life. My first five years I lived in chicken coops with not enough bacon. My mother showed her witch face in the night and told stories of bluebeards. My dream lifted me right out of my bed. I dreamt I jumped into the nozzle of a gun to fight it out with a bullet. I met Kafka and he jumped over a building to get away from me. My body turned into sugar, poured into tea. I found the meaning of life. All I needed was ink to be a black boy. I walk on the street looking for eyes that will caress my face. I sang in the elevators, believing I was going to heaven. I got off at the 86th floor, walked down the corridor looking for fresh butts. My, my cum turns into a silver dollar on the bed. I look out the window and see nobody. I go down to the street, look up at my window and see nobody. So I talk to the fire hydrant, asking, Do you have bigger tears than I do? Nobody around. I piss anywhere. My Gabriel horns, my Gabriel horns, unfold the cheerfulies, my gay jubilation. The end. That was written in 1857 in Paris. Okay, so that concludes my presentation on uh, FrenchCourtalist.com. So I'll just quickly, this is uh, The Adventures of the Roving Romantic. Uh, the Allen Ginsberg interview, and finally, Tropic of Poetry, which is Will Wynn's book. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, beautiful people. <laughs>